Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. We believe that each of our guests here on the show is special, but our guest today has traveled an especially long way to join us today. It's my pleasure to welcome John Peaty, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. John, welcome to the Marianas. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. So nice to have you here. I understand you grew up in a small town, and I'm just wondering... Being on our small islands, does anything seem familiar? Uh, sure. I, I grew up in Mississippi in the Deep South and graduated a class of 29 people. And so uh, certainly going around the island uh, with Leo and other people from the Humanities Council and from the board, and everywhere you go, somebody's hugging, somebody's saying hello. <laughs> and um, the, the, this idea that, that no one's anonymous in a community. Uh, I love that, and, and frankly, I quite often miss that in Washington, D.C. So what brings you all the way out here to Guam and the Marianas? Uh, well, uh, successful lobbying. Uh, that's the first thing I'll say. You have such strong humanities advocate I, advocates. I think the real question is, how could I not be here? Uh, but, as a, but as a more precise answer, uh, we have convenings uh, and for decades across the mainland of the United States with the state humanities directors and their staffs come together, the territorial commonwealth councils come together, and uh, of course the Northern Marianas, the Guam, American Samoa, and Hawaii councils came together and said, let's have, uh, in Honolulu, let's have that conference. And so I was invited to be a speaker at the conference, and then naturally that evolved into a conversation uh, that I could I come here? And so I was happy to be here and in Guam uh, yesterday. You know, I get asked a lot, what are the humanities? And and I give the answer as best I can at the moment. Um, now that we have the chairman uh, with us, let me ask you to define what are the humanities? Sure. I know I should have an elevator speech, but I say it differently <laughs> every time. But if I'm in an elevator with a member of Congress, and I often am, what I'll start is what is familiar to someone? So say the humanities are history. It's a Ken Burns documentary. It is a work of literature, and it's helping us to understand that work. So if you're talking about a university, that's what we often call the liberal arts, philosophy, literature, history, political science, jurisprudence. That means then, of course, that we fund museums, we fund libraries, we fund scholars, researchers, archaeologists. But what does it all add up to? We want to explain the past. We want to help people interpret the present, and we want to help them shape the future. And there's no way you can do that if you don't have some bedrock understanding of, of your community, your society. If you want to live a life with a moral vision, then that means you need to have the humanities in your life. Among, in addition to philosophy, the humanities include religion and the study of religion, for example. Are you saying then that the humanities, which, as you mentioned, we all often think of as things that have happened in the past, that have been written in the past, that they have a role to play in influencing current events or our response to current events? Absolutely. So take uh, my uh, tour uh, today uh, with, with Leo. Uh, I'm looking out at a tank in the surf. The Battle of Saipan is visually present as, as young people go to school here on the island. I laid a, a reef at the memorial. Um, history lives on. Um, and I can quote, again, being from Mississippi, I, you know, William Faulkner on that, um, where he said, the past is not dead, it's not even the past. And this idea that, uh, particularly when we want to think, if we shift gears, we want to talk about our culture, Certainly culture is a living thing, and, and so the humanities, I think, help us to understand how the past informs our current lives. Now, you didn't actually start off with the dream of becoming chairman of the 
NEH, um, you kind of started off in a totally different field. Tell us a little bit about your personal path from where you started um, to where you are now and how that path influences your leadership today. Oh, sure. Uh, well, and I made a point in talking to high school students and, and junior high students today. I, I don't think we say enough to the young people that, you know, you can change your mind about what you're going to do. We used to call that false starts. I don't say that anymore. Mm-hmm. These aren't failures. This mm-hmm. is finding our path. And so my parents are first generation college educated. My father became a surgeon. My mother was a leader in hospital administration. I thought that was my path. I studied the sciences, thought I'd be a doctor, and I had no talent for it, and frankly, not much interest in it through college. What I loved were the stories around hospitals. I loved patient care and and how I intersected with them. I just didn't know that I loved the storytelling aspect, the documenting of their lives even, more than I did care itself and, and, and didn't have a gift for that. And it took me a long time to find that path. Um, in some ways to give myself permission. Um, But all the time from high school to college, as I was playing football in high school and other things, as as I was doing the social things a college student does, was reading poetry and writing poetry and drawing. And uh, it was a switch I could never turn off. And so um, I've now spent the last 25 years of my life in the arts and humanities as a grant maker, writer, editor. Now that you've had um, an opportunity to see Guam and the Marianas Mm. in person, um, tell us how small councils like ours fit into the larger picture of the NEH. Uh, Most people in America don't know we exist. Um, Are our stories important overall to what the NEH is trying to accomplish? The stories this council is bringing forward aren't just important, they're essential. I think that uh, that you can't tell the story of a nation without telling thousands of stories together. And you can't tell the story of a nation without telling the story of the commonwealths, the territories, that, that and in this particular case, define the outer edges of this. And, and if I want to understand what my identity is um, as an American, I need to include those territories, those commonwealths. It, it, um, it seems to me that any properly understood national identity has to be elastic and, and has to know that the experience of somebody in New England is very different from somebody one generation into a life in California, for example. And the ambition of the National Endowment for the Humanities is to fund and to speak to all of them. I go back to the founding legislation of our agency in 1965, and it says, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. And I love that. And by the way, it doesn't just say, in fact, it doesn't say at all, rather, wisdom and vision and our elected officials, just our elected officials, it ca- says in each of us, it calls us to engage citizenship. And something that is really, I think, increasingly an anchor of my chairmanship is this idea of engaged citizenship. As, as the idea that we can't, particularly when I think of our young people, we can't say that you have all these rights uh, living in a representative democracy without telling them also here are the responsibilities of living in a democracy. And so I think we owe them that. And, and again, all that was so well framed that democracy is inherently linked with wisdom. And it's inherently linked with having a vision. And that res- responsibility resides in each of us. And, and so for me, that's, that's very powerful. Are there any uh, particular projects that you've heard about being in the Marianas in Guam that kind of um, support uh, this vision? Absolutely. Uh, One thing that both councils have a deep commitment to is veterans. Uh, And and that's been wonderful to hear. And I'll actually say across the Pacific Islander councils. Uh, So uh, Mother Reads, Father Reads, this is an important part of that. Um, uh, conversations about reintegration of 
veterans into civilian life, uh, the Women Warriors Project, for example, being one example of that. And also um, what I've also appreciated going back a little bit more with the council here, they had a We the People grant. This was back in 2009, and that still echoes through, and it's about uh, – these these standalone uh, topics such as uh, civic tourism, for example, which now we would call cultural tourism and, frankly, economic development even. And um, as we'll be talking about increasingly in, coming, in the coming years, the U.S. is in 2026 is going to celebrate the 250th na- uh, year of nationhood. And uh, the, that's called the semi-quincentennial. A word that we'll all have to learn how to say Semi- consistently. Semi-quincentennial. Okay. Yes, yes. A and bunch then of s- learn how to spell it. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's all Latin, um, so the Latin teachers at, uh, will be quite happy. Uh, but another grant here that um, uh, is, a, is a grant um, on migration, which I think is important. Uh, to have an, an island when so many different groups are coming here, the indigenous populations, these two anchor strong populations, but also immigration where Filipino workers and and others coming into that. And what does that look like in neighborhoods and communities in in the telling of a collective story as well as individual stories? And so I think the Humanities Council is particularly well positioned to have these kind of conversations. And um, also as we saw today, with looking at talking about voyagers and and constructing uh, in, in, the, in the traditional manner uh, a voyaging canoe, that uh, we're also making sure that we talk about the humanities not simply be something in textbooks, but tangible anchor of customs and traditions and language coming together. And so to see that that work being done uh, right there at the water to look up above it and see the thatched roof um, that fairly well withstood a typhoon. A super typhoon. A super typhoon when a lot of modern construction projects certainly did not. Um, That's a testimony to what we call traditional knowledge. And if one thing I would communicate is that I love books, I've edited books, I've funded books, But we should know that there are many ways of knowing in the world, just as there are many forms and roots of wisdom. You mentioned um, about the We the People grant 10 years ago, and that's actually the grant that started this radio show. And it's an excellent example of the humanities making opportunities for the community to kind of explore what's what's important to them and and pursuing it, um, whether it be through a mini grant or... Uh, talking to the council about what projects they'd like them to undertake. Absolutely, and um, let me let me brag on on your radio show and you that the, the Humanities Magazine that we distribute uh, to the White House, members of Congress, college presidents, university presidents, nonprofit leaders across America and overseas. Uh, it of course opens up with not only a conversation about the Humanities Council but about this show. So, uh, and what. Uh, really I think connects is that you are preserving history and, and people are telling you stories and that it's on the radio it means it's not just in an archive where only maybe scholars might access it but it it's a reminder that stories are a living thing the culture is a living thing and and we might very well have someone who's studying here at the community college which I visited today and saw their archives and they may go on to a four-year institution, whether in Guam or the mainland or someone else, and it may be hearing this show that gave them a little spark when they were a teenager, and they went off and did what one might do in life. They spent their 20s doing something else. They joined the military, and they come back, and they say, what I want to do is share the story of my people or my island or my islands, plural, and uh so I don't think we ever quite know when we put something like this into the world, all the ripples that go from that stone. Mm, that's true. Mm-hmm. And it, it really is a, a community effort. Um, all the guests that open up, you know, because people really, they're opening up a part of their lives, not only just what they do, but who they are, 
when they they, they share their stories and then um, so it's a beautiful thing really um the other uh project um we've talked a lot about cultural preservation and some of that is very concrete is about works in public libraries and about universities and the the other thing I really want to note is the council having a preservation grant from us, and this supports uh, a range of activities. But, but most notably, it helps cultural heritage workers update their knowledge, find out the latest trends in the fields, and I think that's particularly important. And at the federal level, um, after the hurricanes in uh, Texas, Puerto Rico, Louisiana, and Florida. Uh, we worked with a lot of different groups, including with FEMA, to make sure there's a disaster recovery plan. And we were very happy to hear that the archives at the community college were intact, uh, and really their, their strongest building, as it turns out. Uh, but some of our conversations today were about future forecasting and about you know disaster preparedness in terms oh. of uh, cultural assets. So that's another way we, at the federal level, we fund the state councils and territory councils, as you know. H he here uh, in Saipan, that means about 80 to 90 percent of the funds are federal funds. Uh, we have direct applications from museums, and uh, had on a wonderful tour of the museum today uh, also. And, uh, and then another way is not grants, but knowledge, sharing best practices in a lot of areas of research, of scholarship. And so um, part of the pleasure of being here is to have those conversations on all three levels uh, with l cultural leaders here. We're chatting today with John Petey, chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we'll be back with more after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. John, um, you spent some time, as you mentioned, with high schoolers today. You, you're, you're here for less than a day. Why did you choose to spend time with high schoolers? I couldn't imagine the chairmanship without meeting with students. Um, I like university students, community college students, uh, but the high schoolers, junior high, um, these are the central audiences to me. This is that time where you're trying to figure out who you are, and I say this as a father of a 19-year-old who's, who's in college, and uh, I have such empathy for the teachers of, of the young people at that age. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and also, I give them credit for asking questions. Really, you know, did they ask good questions. Today? They did. They, yeah. you know, they 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 asked questions. And you know what I really appreciated is the other students didn't kind of give them grief. You know, uh -huh. they, you know, sure you have to wait for that first person to ask a question, but they ask very good ones. And they, you know, how's the agency structured? What do we do? Of course, what are the humanities? Uh, and it was great. And I talked a little bit about kind of shaping a career and. I, th I think one thing I tried to make the case is that, you know, life's a journey, that this, this idea that um, the skills we need in almost any job are the ability to write well, I think that really matters, and certainly critical reasoning, and empathy. And by the way, uh, I noted to them, we hear a lot about the humanities versus STEM. We have parents saying, you've got to be in the sciences, technology, engineering, math, to make a living. And the statistics just simply don't support that if we're talking about uh, lifetime earnings. But I pointed out to them that Google had done a study of their most successful, highest performing teams, and they've identified eight skills. The ranked eighth was the STEM skill. The other seven, the first seven of the eight, were humanity skills. And they did name critical reasoning skills. They did name team building and cohesion. They named empathy uh, and the ability to communicate, for example. So I, I think 
it's also about demystifying the process, telling them you don't have to know what you're going to do. For the and rest of your life. Y- yes. When you're 17. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, I, I'm, I'm 50 years old, and, I, and every five or six years, I'm reinventing myself. I realized in retrospect that all I've done my entire life is told stories. But I began as a book editor, and then I was a magazine editor, and then I was a communication director for college. And then I became a grant maker at the National Endowment for the Arts. And then I wrote speeches for a U.S. president and the first lady. And then I, w- re- I was publisher of a magazine at a university and then now running this agency. Every single one of those jobs was different from the one before, and they were all about telling a story. Mm-hmm. And uh, so maybe I was living a life in the humanities before I knew it. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the writers that stays in my mind is Zornil Hurston, wonderful novelist, uh, folklorist. She was an African-American writer in the mid-20th century, and she had great professors who knew her talents, but she didn't always have the opportunities in life that she would have if she were alive now. And one time, Zornil Hurston, the author of The Eyes Were Watching God, that mm-hmm. wonderful novel, she said, research is formalized curiosity. Mm. If you really ask me what business am I in, I'm in the business of curiosity. I seek it in others. I fund it when I have that opportunity. I seek it in myself. I hope I bring it into the world, and I've lived it all my life. And if somebody says, on this island, in this moment, with all the anxieties we might have in life, why do the humanities matter? And I would say, it matters because you deserve to have a full life. You deserve to hand off a world to a young generation that can have meaningful, impactful, fulfilling lives. And I don't know how they could possibly have that if they had the humanities absent from their life, absent uh, from their landscape. And uh, and in an island, being proud of traditions, looking at the Lattes and the and the echoes of the depressions, even in the land where there may have been a latte. There's the cultural memory is always lingering in the terrain and in the land, and um, the people who seek that and the, and the people that are both driven to change the world and the people who are at peace in the world, I believe, are curious people. And curious people have the humanities in their lives by whatever name. It's a pleasure to have the chairman here to kind of give us this kind of vision coming from the top of the organization and how it affects our individual lives. Um, Another thing you spent, uh, invested, I would say, time in uh, today was meeting with reporters. Um, Why was that important to you? Well, I believe as a practical matter, I'm head of a federal agency representing the public spending tax dollars which to me means that I need to be accountable to the public. And one way to be accountable to the public is is to communicate through the media. And so I make a point to let the media know when I'm going somewhere. If we have opportunity for, you know, a live radio show or sit down television or print interview, we do it. And uh, so this is, again, because of the Humanities Council here is so well woven into the community we were able to have television and print uh, uh, reporters together and staffers and and to have a conversation. Yes, they asked me questions on the record, but we got to more essential things too, uh, which is uh, the foundation of where did we get freedom of the press and and how that ties into the founding documents. You know the the the. Again, I talk about rights and responsibilities together, but but certainly our founding documents, certainly the Declaration and the, and the Constitution. And so I found that to be a lively conversation, and, um, and they, asked, they asked insightful questions. So what does the future hold for NEH at large? Um, is there anything on the horizon, and, and how might that impact us here in the Marianas and Guam? So where we are with the Humanities Endowment, um, our budget of $155 million a year is the largest budget in a decade. 
Um, both houses of Congress support us. Both political parties in Congress support us. Wait, I thought they were just going to cut your budget la- last year or the year before. So, to to be clear, uh, so President Trump uh, stated that the Humanities Endowment and the Arts Endowment weren't federal funding priorities. So he recommended to Congress uh, that the agency be eliminated. And um, that came to Congress. And with the Republicans in charge of the House and the Senate, they decided not to end the agency but increase the budget. And then when the House went uh, to the Democrats and the Senate stayed with the Republicans, again, they voted in tandem to increase our budget. So... My responsibility is, is I don't, um, not, I'm, by law, I cannot advocate for our budget. I can educate uh, members of Congress and the White House about what we do with the funds once they fund us. Uh, but I should be clear that no one in the White House or in Congress has ever said to me that the arts and the humanities don't matter in our society. They may have differences of opinion about whether it should be federally subsidized or not. Uh, but uh, we do indeed have, as you know, the largest budget in a decade, and I, uh, and and we, I have 140 dedicated colleagues, and uh, I think th- we enjoy that budget because of the work of the staff, and because of the integrity of the grant review process, and also because of our state and territorial councils really make a difference at their at a granular level, at the community level, at the personal level, in a way that we simply couldn't do from Washington alone. So I look at it as, as, as we go forward and we look at this semi-quincentennial, one of my responsibilities is to make sure that, yes, we're going to talk about monumental moments. We're going to talk about world wars. We're going to talk about... Uh, things such as the suffrage movement. We funded the 19th Amendment film that will be on PBS. Uh, I think that's a great example that every community can have a conversation about women's right to vote, uh, women in politics, uh, women, you know, leadership. There are any number of conversations that can be had at the community level and anchored into this national uh, documentary we're funding. Um, so I, again, look at the 250th, it's not the story of 1776 alone, not the story of the 13 British colonies, but the story of America reaching from Maine to where we are in the studio at this very moment. Our guest today has been uh, John Petey, chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any final thoughts before we go, John? Thank you for having me here. It's, it's been a pleasure. Anytime I'm in the neighborhood, <laughs> I'm going to be back. Um, uh, y'all get me in trouble with my uh, friends in America, Samoa, because I wasn't able to work them into this trip. Oh, uh, so I, I know I will be uh, back in Oceana. Um, but what has struck me, people ask me, is, is any of this, is this alien to you? I, I grew up not far from, you know, I go to New Orleans, I go to Florida, where my mother is from. So, you know, water and sand and mm. palm trees, you know, and thick vegetation, the, the humidity, the, all this is my childhood in many ways. Okay. But, but what really is the commonality is the friendship, the sense of community, um, smiling faces and kind of laughter. And um, if that's what the humanities are here, I'm deeply proud to be a part of it. Well, thank you also for your leadership and for all you do um, for the people of the nation, including us here in the Marianas. Thank you. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. (laughs) 